you seem to you seem to have come through a a period that who knows what was going on, but you seem to have bounced out of it is what I would say. It's a miracle to me, another miracle of my life. To be, do, <laughs> to be doing what we're doing this morning uh, after where I was in May when we last talked. Right. It's just unbelievable. I said to my daughter this morning, <clears throat> it's like I was descended into the depths of the ocean and brought up a little too fast and I'm still suffering the bends. <laughs> This has all happened so fast, I can't quite catch up to it all. I trust the self in each of us. Yeah. We've each come a long way. No doubt. And no doubt. We are here in that presence, and we're open to that. Today, I'm going to have a conversation with Nancy Pfaff. And Nancy is quite a remarkable woman who has a master's degree in Christian spirituality, which is the Christian experience of God. And so I will be very interested in hearing what Nancy has to say. Nancy is going to talk to us in terms of her uh, Christian individuation process. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to me because of the talk I'm giving in October on finding the living God. And Nancy's been quite helpful uh, to me in putting that together already. And I imagine there will be more from now. So Nancy has prepared a PowerPoint to aid in our discussion. So I'm going to share that with you now. So this is Nancy, and uh, she's an artist living in Reno, Nevada. And so, Nancy, why don't you tell us a little bit, first of all, about yourself, and then how you came to this idea of uh, Christian individuation. Well, I started young as a Christian, about four years old, going to Sunday school. And that eventually bloomed into a real relationship with God through Jesus Christ in love and has been matured till today. There's a sense in which there is a union of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. So it's been quite a journey from a very uh, concrete level of faith to a much more open and free period of faith. That's uh, very interesting indeed. So the concrete idea of faith was based on like Sunday school lessons or something like that, is that right? Well, as I started out, I loved going to Sunday school. I think my parents liked to get all us kids out of the house on Sunday morning, send us off on our bikes down to church. But I loved the children's sermon, which was a good story with a moral ending, and the hymns we used to sing, like, This is My Father's World, and uh, I Come to the Garden Alone When the Dew is Still on the Roses, and there were many songs that I loved to sing. But most of all, I loved the Bible stories. I loved the story of David and Goliath and the miracle God accomplished there. And Daniel in the lion's den and the miracle God accomplished there. So in that early period of faith, I had a kind of a, a beginning sense of the numinous. That, that, that there was a real God and that this real God was involved in the world and could do amazing things. That was just kind of picked up intuitively. I didn't think about that much consciously. How would you define numinous today? Well, numinous today for me has a number of intensities. <laughs> so that something like our first image is of a rose. And I went out into the garden early one morning. The sun was just starting to come up. And I was out, but deadheading the roses and came around the bush and saw this with the sun shining through it you can see the rays in the background and the darkness you can see the thorns on the branches behind 
And I had to get a picture of that and what that represented for me at that time. This was an intensity, maybe, I don't know, a level 25 on the numinosity scale. Right. That's but a very I, powerful picture. That's just an amazing picture of a rose, by the way. And what this did was to mirror on the outside what was taking place in me spiritually on the inside because the divine feminine had arisen to join the divine masculine. Because I grew up in the Christian faith with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit presumed to be masculine, I had a very concrete sense of God as masculine. Mm -hmm. But when the divine feminine rose this summer, it was just this summer, to join the divine masculine, I felt alive in a way I'd never felt before. And that was of a numinosity that was probably 80 on the numinosity scale. I was trying to grapple with this. What do I do now? Because I used to pray, and in my imagination, I would picture Jesus present, because the scripture says he is always <clears throat> interceding for us. So I would go to the prayer room to be with Jesus to do my own praying for friends and family in the world. And I would bring them into the presence of Jesus and myself and let Jesus handle whatever their need was. So there was the very sense of a masculine figure as a, a key in my prayer. So when the divine feminine arose, it was crowded in that prayer room. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to handle anything. So I knew enough to say, well, it's going to let me know how to do this. So as I'm trying to figure out how, what to imagine as I pray for others. Now, when I'm just being present to God, I don't need any images. But it does help me in intercession to have something going on in my imagination that makes God more concrete. Mm -hmm. So here I was coming into the prayer room with Jesus and this divine feminine, which was not clearly defined. It was an impression, a slight outline, but it was of the essence of the rose we just saw. Right. And while I was just in prayer, holding the question, how do I do this now? The divine feminine melted into a pool Jesus melted into a pool, and I melted into a pool, and we all ran together. So for me, I call this Trinity. Right. Now, when you mention a prayer room, is that a room that you have in your house now, or where is the prayer room? The prayer room is in my imagination. I see. Okay. Yeah. And it's something that you've always had in your imagination, or only recently? Well, you know, it has changed dramatically over time. There have been many years go by where there were, was no conscious relationship with God, where I dropped out. I'd had it, you know, in various places. And we can talk about those at some point. The image of God for me has formed and shattered and formed and shattered and reformed and shattered so that it has grown and changed over a lifetime. And each time that image has shattered, it's been a devastating dark night of the soul for me yeah. until some new, something new arose. It had to be given me. It was something that had to be given me, not something I could construct. Right. This collage that we were looking at a moment ago, was that done recently or, or yes. long ago? No, this was done very recently. This only happened, I don't have a date on it, but I'm guessing in August, perhaps. Of 2019? Yes. August. Okay. Yes. And we're speaking in September of 2019. So this is only a month ago. What inspired you to do that collage? Well, because I had had that inner experience, and it's not just seeing something on a movie screen. Sure. It's, it's a full feeling of embodiment. It, it's a very real happening, but it's within the mind or the psyche. And 
I wanted to bring it out into the outer world because I find that that helps cement it. It helps make it more real. And then if I forget that vision, if I can't seem to go back and get at it again, then I've got that image, that say the collage that I can sit with and let it come up again. And of course, that's what Dr. Jung recommended as your personal red book to do something like that and then to treat it as your church. Yes, and I, I did start my own red book. I meant to bring it today, but what I did was just for people that might want to do it in a simple way. I got a sketchbook, just a simple sketchbook, I think, from Walmart, mm -hmm. and a red piece of construction paper that I ran through my printer that says Nancy Pfaff's Red Book, and pasted that on the cover. And then I just do, when I'm coming, bringing a dream, let's say, I want to work on a dream. Right. I'll take my, t I'll have the dream in mind. I'll take the time to make the lines on the paper that I'm going to write on. And so I'm making those lines. I'm holding the dream in consciousness and letting it come closer and closer. And then when I'm ready, I write down the dream I see. on those lines. And then I have a little, a little square that I sketch the most important image of the dream in. And it's just a child's image. It's not artwork like Jung did. It is artwork like Jung did. I mean, he may have been more skilled at, in terms of performing art, but all of us, whatever we do is, is our artwork. It's holding, it, as you say, it's holding in mind some message that we've received from the self or the God image. That's uh, right. Working with those dreams are just incredibly important. Jung said it's an important, urgent message. And so taking time with those dreams are essential. And I'd like to share the image number two right? called Big Dream and talk a little bit about this. December 30th of last year, 2018, I had this dream. And in the dream, I'm in this giant hallway with a 20 to 30 foot being that is an androgynous being. And it has the same quality as the T-1000 in Terminator 2, if any of you saw that, mm. that could kind of, was this kind of flowing metal creature. So it certainly was an alien creature. And it was numinous on a scale of 100. Wow. Okay. Luminosity. And it was quite overwhelming, but not threatening. But there was absolutely no connection between us. And it looked right at me, and I could not but look right back at it. Then the dream was over, and I couldn't pull it back. I, I'm so glad I wrote just a few little notes as soon as that dream was over, because by morning it had completely faded. The night before, I had been reading Edinger's Ego and Archetype, and can you guess what chapter I was reading? I can't guess offhand, but go ahead. And tell. The, the alienated ego. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> What's your connection then with, it, with that? Well, what, what was happening here, this preceded a great and deep and darkest period of my life. Mm -hmm. And I think this was uh, something to say, this part of your life is, is going to be terminated. Mm -hmm. And something new is going to come about. And I want a connection with you that I do not have with you. That's kind of the impression I got from the Very movie. interesting. Very interesting. So I, as soon as I could, I painted this image to try to get some kind of memory down as to what had happened. Because I couldn't pull it back from memory. It was just too numinous, too highly charged. Yeah, it's a very powerful image. Even though you may think it's not particularly special in terms of presentation, I think it's very special. I've obviously put some thought into the background there, and if not consciously, unconsciously you've done. Yes. And I'm finding it numinous just looking at the image. And, and of course, this is uh, 
very similar to an image that is found in the Red Book, where Dr. Jung meets Isdabar. Well, I have heard you say in the past, in fact, quite recently, that these kinds of dreams seem to come, or these kinds of numinous break-ins seem to come in times of trauma. And so I had been going through, uh, not quite, well, let's see, it had been a year following my partner's death, which had been very difficult. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had broken off the relationship and wanted no further contact in early 2017 and then he died in August 2017 and I didn't know it until my daughter called me and said she wanted to come over and she had something to tell me and she had heard from his step granddaughter that he had died but she wasn't sure what day to have loved someone deeply and to have the relationship closed off suddenly and then not to be able to get in contact. His family would not uh, allow contact. Mm -hmm. Told me that their father didn't want anything more to do with me. Mm -hmm. It was a very painful, uh, difficult period. Oh, I'm sure. And it was very shattering. And it was on top of having chronic fatigue syndrome, which reemerged in 2014. He was diagnosed in <clears throat> 2012. So on top of that ser serious illness, to have that particular thing happen was very crushing. And I felt like I almost lost my mind. I was grateful for the grief group that our St. Mary's Hospital hospice had that let me be with people who could, you know, help me feel like my craziness and instability and so forth was normal under those circumstances. Well, assuredly it, it was, and what I've found from my own losses is that those people still live in our hearts every bit as much as they ever did, and yes. no relationship is perfect, of course, and, you know, part of growing up is learning that fact. <laughs> That's but, true. Right. That's very right. right Sad but, but true. Right. So I have this dream. Right. That that it's it's a marker of a significant change. The kind right. of change you may or may not live through. Right. So <laughs> that the, yes. Okay. So, so this is I think this is one of the clearest images of the cell that I've Definitely. ever had in a dream. Definitely. And the, Definitely. Um, the and androgynous aspect was extremely important to the bringing up of the divine feminine. Mm -hmm. And I might just share how that happened. Okay. Because uh, a friend of mine named Maureen and I, we've been friends for some time, we met in the grief group, and we were on an outing to the Episcopal Church in Reno, which has regular organ recitals. And this was in July, and we have Art Town in July. Everybody should come to Nevada, Reno in July. Mm -hmm. And we were going to this organ concert. And so I was sitting next to her, and I began to get a sense of her as a numinous being. And I knew that meant I was projecting. And so as soon as I realized this was a projection, I, th I thought in my mind, could this be the, and the feminine androg androgynous aspect of that figure in the dream? And the minute I thought that, the second I thought that, the divine feminine was very clear within my being, clear in the sense of impression, which the rose we just saw captured. Right. The essence of. So that was that. I th what did I say? That was an eighty percent numinous. 80 well, that's, a, that's pretty numinous. <laughs> but let me let me. Yeah. I'll share the image from uh, Dr. Jung's Red Book, which is very similar to your dream. This appears on page thirty-six of the Red Book. You can see down at Isdabar's feet, actually under his feet, yes. is is that very small human and that very small yeah. human is is Jung himself right yes in, in the story as it appears in the red book and and so it's amazing how 
close your dream image is to this dream, this image that Dr. Young produced. And of course, he worked on it for 16 years, so he developed a much more comprehensive style, but and he had been doing it since childhood. But I'm just amazed that the, the setup of that image and the setup of your dream image is almost identical. And so here's your image with the giant and, and you down beneath the feet as well. Very interesting. I thought we might move from where I am today I don't know if I need to share any more about the difficult period I was in. It's up to, might, it's up to you if you I want might to. say one more thing. After December 30th, 2018, um, so Lee, Lee had, I had gone over the, our history, and my, also my dog had died of 13 years. My precious dog died during that period between Lee's cutting things off and his mm -hmm. dying. This caused the chronic fatigue syndrome to, to really rev up. And I was uh, almost, well, I was unable to drive. I was unable to cook for myself. I had to have people come in and, and cook and so forth. Uh, quite debilitated. And then I was given a serious cancer diagnosis, a melanoma on my left leg behind the knee. And that required surgery. So I was in a very debilitated state facing a significant surgery and cancer. Mm -hmm. My doctor had not been able to find a pain medication I could take. And when I was diagnosed with the melanoma, my body started to shake and I'm still shaking. Yeah. I, I feel like, you know, this is going to work itself out. But I was, I was really under the greatest pressure, I think, that I've ever been under. Mm. And one day I went to my counselor and I said, I'm starting to have suicidal thoughts. And she could tell from my demeanor that I was in no condition to go home alone. And so she said, uh, do you want to go to the hospital or do you want to go to your adult children? And I said, well, definitely not the hospital. Well, which child? Well, I couldn't even make a decision. So she called both of them right in my presence, told them basically that their mother was unable to care for herself and needed to be picked up and taken to their house, mm. which for the ego was a tremendously shattering experience. Oh, I can imagine. My heavens. Which was necessary. And so when we talked, in in May of 2019, I was in bed at my daughter's house, having been in a very uh, serious state of collapse. I call it a crisis. My counselor says you did not collapse. <laughs> so well, I'm not supposed to call it a collapse. It okay. was a crisis. Yeah. But out of that, then uh, I'll share more later, or I could continue on this theme of what happened next. But that part, that dark part, was essential for where I am today. And I'll, I can talk about that more later. What I'd kind of like to do now is to take a look at uh, childhood and just to point out that for the child, there are numinous experiences that may seem quite mundane to us as adults, but for the child, they're not. And so if you could go to picture image number four. Here is image number four. So the very, very dark part of that image refers to my first memory, which is of waking up in a coma about the age of three. It was during World War II. My dad was in the Army, the Army Air Corps at that time. And uh, somehow I had gotten into some medications and I, was, I woke up in this coma, and I was wide awake, very clear in my mind, but I could not open my eyes or move my arms and legs. And I think of that time as my first meeting with the dark side of God, as I look back upon it now. Mm -hmm. But I also think that that called me to the inner life that I've led. So it was both dark and light. 
And then in Sunday school one day, we were given this cross to take home, and it would glow in the dark. And for a child, this was a great mystery and connected me with the reality of God at night in the dark. Terrific. It was uh, like a plastic cross or something that had luminous yes. paint on it or something? I have no idea what, what it was made of, but it was plastic, and whatever the plastic was made of, it wasn't painted. Mm -hmm. But uh, whatever the, the quality of the material, it glowed in the dark. Oh, tremendous. Very interesting. And I'm sure for a child, that's a, that's a very big deal. So and, God, God was with me, you see, mm -hmm. uh, in that glowing cross, not in a conscious recognition, but just mm -hmm. kind of an open childlike uh, assumption of truth. Right. But also seeing the dark side as well. And I'm, yeah. I'm sure it was quite frightening hearing what was going on in the war to a, to a child at that time. It was very difficult because uh, my mother... Uh, lived next door to her grandmother, mm -hmm. and her grandmother raised uh, her grandson, whose name was Bill, and Bill was killed in Italy during that, this period of my wow. early childhood. Uh, her other cousin, her father's brother's son, Bob, was a prisoner of war in a German prison camp. Wow. <laughs> and then my mother's, or my father's brother, Earl, was killed in France. And then my, gra my great-grandmother, my mother's grandmother, died of breast cancer. So all these things were going on in my atmosphere early right. on as a child. And that, that it would be traumatic and, and therefore, in a sense, numinous. I mean, you have the dark side luminosity in that case and yes. um, I just remember inter interesting coincidence factoid but uh, my mother-in-law was born on December 7th and so it was her 11th birthday when Pearl Harbor took place mm. and uh, of course that was a very traumatic day for her because she was in the middle of her 11th birthday party and all of a sudden this news started to come in. And then ironically, her daughter, my wife, now Debbie, was born on August the 9th, which is Nagasaki Day. It's, it was the last, the last uh, military engagement of World War II. Mm. And so there are two birthdays bracket the war right. anyway right. well we we both relate to the tough times of that period definitely definitely so we could go on to image number five brief okay three. you're you're skipping image number three now uh let, let me just show you what it is and, and then okay we well the, okay we're going back now to uh i had been talking about the big dream image, after which great darkness. After right. the divine feminine arose, I had one day this sense of absolute evil wanting to rise out of the unconscious, and that if it did, I would go into a psychosis. Mm -hmm. and I remembered that Jung had told Robert A. Johnson that if you give it form, you'll be okay. So with that sense of absolute evil uh, at the edge of consciousness, I sat down, and this is the image that came out. And when I was done, I wish, you know, I had it around and looked at it, and it did. It actually did the absolute evil coming up disappeared. It went back into the unconscious. So you were... You envisioned yourself as creating this shield, this well, symbol. I, I did not know it was a shield until I was sharing it with someone the other day. Mm -hmm. And as I was looking at it in her hands, I said, it's a shield. It's a yeah, shield. It definitely and, is. And then another friend of mine said, it has a crystalline structure, which is the strongest structure that is. 
made of the most common element, sand. And so here I am, a common element made of dust, you know, and standing against absolute evil with my shield. But just to point out, you know, that when something like the numinous divine feminine rises, there's going to be a corresponding darkness that right. wants to come into the picture as well. Right. Definitely. Yeah. That's the compensation and you have to select the, for the good. I did want to emphasize that give it form. What wants to come up out of the unconscious? You've often said, get a box of paints and look and see what color you want to use, what shape you want it to be. And that's what I did. Right. And so that's just what happened. You know, it just came together. Yeah, it's very powerful when you do that. I mean, I'm a big fan of the adult coloring books for this reason that yes. um, if you just have an adult coloring book and just have some some pencils with it, it can be very powerful to just let your psyche tell you which color to put in any given space. And if you do that for a period of time, it tells your psyche that you're paying attention to, yes. to the self. And the image on the coloring book that you're working with is of any significance. But what is it significance is the fact that you've made this connection with the unconscious. So here's the next one then. Okay, so this is called Breathe Free. And I grew up in a very difficult home as a child. I was taken away from a secure environment where I lived while my dad was in World War II. And when he returned, he was quite an alcoholic. And so things at home were unsettling, dangerous at times, very emotionally painful. And I would go out behind my house, cross Highway 395 South into the ranching area there and go through some barbed wire fence to get to an old railroad bridge, the old V&T that used to run between Virginia City and other places uh, would go through Minden where I lived at that time. Mm -hmm. And there I was in the midst of these tall reeds and grasses with the birds singing. It was very peaceful. The musty smell of the marsh was there. Nobody was around. It was just me and the sunshine and the birds. And I think for me, as I look back, this I was meeting the divine feminine. I was with the divine feminine in this place, the good mother, the safe mother. I would go here as much as I possibly could. So I think God provides these safety places for us when we're in very difficult situations as children, a person or a place, something that we can maintain hold on our soul. When was this picture painted? I'm just curious. Well, I don't even remember this, but uh, I had a spiritual director who suggested I paint the numinous experiences of my life. And so whenever that was, I can't even think now, I'm guessing it's been since 2006. So between then and today, uh, as I reflected, that was my best impression of me there, alone on the bridge with nature and the birds in the silence. Very interesting, because I had the thought that the main things that we remember in our lifetime are actually numinous experiences. And, you know, that just was sort of a random thought I had about six months ago. And as I go back and turn the pages of my memory, I find that, you know, most of those memories that I remember clearly were quite numinous experiences. Should we go on to the next sure. picture? Sure, let's go to okay. number six, first contact. Okay. The reason I call that first contact is this is the first conscious contact I had of God knowing me personally. I didn't take that in and form 
real thought around it. Again, I was about 12, 13 years old when this happened. And my boyfriend at the time, Leroy Nutting was his name. And this was my first great heart throb. I had little crushes before, but this was my great heart throb. We'd had a first kiss at Christmas time. And then I noticed that he was spending an awful lot of time with another girl. And I came home from school one day. <laughs> I came home from school one day, broken hearted, wondering what was going on. And my sister and I slept in the attic. And so I went up to my little bed and pulled up the covers. And I had this little white Bible. Nancy Lee Watson was my name in gold letters. And I, I, knew about reading Proverbs and the Psalms, that those are good to go to when you have a problem. Mm -hmm. So I was just going through Proverbs and my eye lit on Proverbs 27, 5, better is open rebuke than hidden love, which meant to me better he told me to get lost than to have something going on behind my back. Right. <laughs> so it was so appropriate for that moment. And it caused me to feel uh, that I was companioned by God, that God's love was right there for me, understanding my heart's pain and giving me words to express it, that God knew the pain and the words were evidence that God knew my current heartache. So that was my first contact, what I call first contact. That's that's very good, and and I, I love the fact that you put a rainbow in there. Uh, I think it was on the Bible. It might you, not. It, it might have been another Bible that I had a rainbow on, but uh -huh. uh, that's that's what I remember looking back. You know, from my I would have been in my late sixties, I guess, when I painted this. Uh huh. Very interesting, though. Very good. But just to say that, you know, the children are having these things happen. It helps if they're in a religious context, and it helps if that religious context understands these things and can support and uh, interpret these things to the child. Yeah, that's terrific, actually. So then, not shortly after this, so here I'm having first contact with God, but I... I don't think, let's not go to this one yet. All right. So it was maybe a year after that first contact with God that our Sunday school teacher told us the Bible was not true. And she used as her example that the Virgin Mary was an androgynous figure who had both sexual characteristics within her. And that was how she was able to bring forth baby Jesus. Well, this, this was... Uh, <laughs> That must have been quite shocking. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally shocking, disillusioning. And, my, and there, see, my image of God then was shattered. So then I went through a period uh, of adolescence through, that lasted from about, uh, from I was 14 when I started high school and 21 when I graduated from college. I did a little searching in college. But I really, you know, was, was adrift in terms of spirituality. And during that adolescent period, when I was 19, I was invited to a fraternity dance by a fellow member of uh, my accounting class. And I was drugged and date raped. And that mm. was uh, a huge darkness for me. And I wanted to drop out of college, and I was so glad when my, I didn't know why I wanted to drop out of college after that, but I certainly do today. Mm -hmm. So my mother came in and tried to coax me to finish one more year of college, which I did, and I'm glad I did. But, um, so that period was all without a spiritual grounding, without a spiritual handhold. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a very dark period. And then even into early adulthood, when I got married and start having my children, I still was not having a, a spiritual connection. That incident that happened when I was 13 was so intense and shattering 
that it was standing in the way of my returning to the church or searching for anything else. You're, I'm sorry, which experience was it? The date rape or the... The, um, the Sunday school teacher. Uh, oh, said, oh, 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 yes. Saying about, so that, that, you know, and then the, the, the date rape was just a, a shattering of soul, human soul. Sure. But I, I can but really that, imagine that, that being told that the Virgin Mary was a hermaphrodite. <laughs> oh, my oh, goodness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, that, that's yeah, what I never heard. <laughs> you haven't heard that. I've never heard it for me since either. Oh my God. But anyway, not having my spiritual support system to go through these difficult periods was a great heartache, a great uh, period of disintegration within myself. Mm -hmm. And then one day, it was a Good Friday. You can put that scripture verse up now. Okay. I Sorry. was I was in my I think I was about twenty six or twenty seven when I was in this Good Friday service. It was in our church. We had a new pastor that called it a Black Friday service because they covered all the holy symbols with a black veil. But I heard this this verse for the first time. Yes, God so loved the world as to give the only begotten one that whoever believes may not die but have eternal life. And during this period, there was the Vietnam War was going on. And I thought about all the young men that were over there. I didn't realize you were one of them at the yeah. time. But uh, I thought of all the young men that were giving their lives for their country, that their mothers had uh loved them and yet this in a sense their sons were sent to try to help other people and were in danger of death and i had a little son who was two year old at the time and i loved him with all my heart i'm allergic to animals but i could hold that baby and snuggle with that baby and i loved him mm -hmm. And as I thought, you know, could I, if I were God, let's say, send my son that I love into battle in Vietnam? God, and then all of a sudden, I had that thought, and then all of a sudden, I had the thought, God loves me more. God gave us Christ who gave his life, that I might know the love of God. And I knew... This was a numinous experience that's on the 100 scale, 100 intensity scale, mm -hmm. that um, I was known, not generally by a general God, but by a personal God. And I was known as an individual and loved. I had such a, almost like every cell in my body was vibrating with light and life and love. And that went on for, I don't know if it was a week or a month or three months, but I know my face got hurt because I was smiling all the time. Mm. I was just living inside this tremendous love. We could go to image number eight. Right. Image eight. Okay. So right. this is a painting I did, oh, I'm guessing 2008. And mm. my, my daughter and I had been to France studying prayer and art. And I had come home with the rose windows from the great cathedrals, just, you know, big in my uh, psyche. Yeah. And I had to somehow represent them. And I'm not, I do much better with abstract and, and general painting than something of detail. I tried to do an actual rose window. No, no chance I was going to get that. So this is what came out. And I, I thought, this is a good representation for me of the unconscious. I did not think of it at the time. But you see the kind of the chaos in the back. Mm -hmm. And then you see in the center a round object. Um, I can't remember whether this is a Korean or a Chinese symbol, but it stands for the one or unity. Yeah, the bottom half of that symbol is life or living. I don't 
really recognize the top part of this symbol, but uh, you may be right that it is unity. Okay, I, 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 I forgot. Because it, yeah. yeah, because I'm a because I was trained in Mandarin, I learned a lot about taking apart uh, Chinese symbols. The one on the bottom, be, beneath what looks like a letter D, uh, that's very definitely the symbol for life, you know, living. Well, we and, can certainly see that as the center of our life. Yeah, the center and, of our psyche. Yeah, and, and this came up spontaneously? for. Yes, this came up spontaneously. And uh, then you see the uh, circles with little circles in them. And if you notice right. the little circles, they're in different places in each yes. section mm -hmm. there to represent time. Right. So we're, we're coming from the chaos into time. And then you see the little figures with the flowers and fur, uh, ferns. They almost look like little angels. I didn't intend them to be that, but that's kind mm -hmm. of what they lo look like there. Then we're coming into uh, the human creative realm right. of, ma of matter. Hmm. But at the heart of it all is the self, is the God image, is the God that loves us, that loves me. That's, that's how I see it. I see, I see God as containing the opposites, including the darkness and the light. Sure. This is, this is very powerful. Uh, let me ask you a few questions. Did you know of the significance of the 12 segments to, of this? No, I, it just started out, you know, I drew the, the horizontal and the vertical and filled in the other lines. Huh. Of course, you know that, well, obviously that since ancient times, humanity has been dividing things into 12. So the zodiac yeah. is 12 and, and uh, of course our months are 12 and so on. Did you ever have any experience with Chinese calligraphy? at that time? Uh, I had had some experience. I had been in a, an art class to learn some calligraphy. That was very, a very little tiny bit, let's say, and my hands shake now. I can't, I can't write it with it. But I had the black stone and the ink and mm -hmm. the calligraphy brush. And I, so I learned that technique as an amateur. Right. Okay. So you may have experienced that symbol in any case. It's I may point. have gone looking for it. It probably was in my art book. Uh -huh. okay. uh, I had an art book of Chinese calligraphy, and it right. probably was there. Okay. The, just the rose window idea itself, had you ever been introduced to the idea of the mandala before you did this painting? I don't know that I had any significant experience with the mandala. I might have read about it in some of Young's things, yes. but, but not thought very deeply about it or, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I, I find this image very, very powerful because uh, not only, mainly because of so many references in Dr. Young's work to mandalas, but also obviously to rose windows and, and the idea of time being divided into twelves and so on. It's just, that's an amazing painting. No, I and did not a, notice that till you just said it, that the, time in 12 hours, that's the first time I thought of that or heard yeah, that. And 12 I hours, that. 12 months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that did not occur to me until we're having this conversation. And, and of course, even in the Chinese zodiac, it's 12. There's 12, 12 years in the Chinese zodiac. So obviously, these are ideas that had spread across the world at a very early time in humanity. So that they had, you know, they had resonated, obviously, unconsciously with many, many people around the world in many ways. So this is one of those things from the collective unconscious, we, we'd have to say that. I would say so, yes. Yeah, that all of humanity is really 
turn to these twelves. And you know, even when people talk about sevens, then they talk about fives, so that it adds up to twelve and so on. <laughs> <laughs> so and and they when they talk about threes like the Trinity and then uh, four being a quaternity, you add it up and it's seven, and then the next number five adds five and seven, and you have twelve. So there's a lot of numerology types of issues that are presented here. Yes, and uh, so a very powerful image. So, okay. So at this point, I am, I'm trying to think how old I am. I'm probably 28, 29. And so you did that painting when you were 28? No, when I was about 68, I did the painting. But the experience of God that I was sharing in the Black Friday service and the numinosity of that, I feel that last image help to express some of the okay. luminosity of that last image. I see. Huh. So, but at this, after hearing that and connecting with God in this deep way in love, I felt a great need to tell the whole world what I had discovered and what mm-hmm. was true and real. I had two young children, I think, let's see, about uh, five and three. And I thought, now, if I can just get someone to watch these kids for free, I'll go door to door and tell my story to the neighborhood. (laughs) So I was at a Bible study and heard about a young gal, 19, who had gone up to Oregon to get married. And her fiancé dumped her, and there she was with two-year-old twins, one with a heart condition and no place to go and needed a place. Hmm. So I said, let me go home and talk to my husband and see we might be able to take them in. And there I am, see, wanting to serve God. Wow. So uh, I went home and talked to him, and he's a real good guy and big-hearted and likes to help people. And we had a basement that was suitable for the children and, and the mother. So he said, why not? He said, as long as she's supported by the church, and we're not her only support and so forth. So, so uh, Judy moved in with us with the two-year-old twins. And you think you're doing good for God. But when your son slams the door on a child with a heart condition's finger and takes the tip off of it, and you're going to the hospital with a screaming child and part of her finger in one hand, and, uh, you know, you're... you're thinking twice about helping people in God's name. In other words, I just want to say that that um, when we do, it, it is important to reach out in love and to help those that we can help. Uh, like you had, I can't remember her name in recently from... Yeah. From uh, Gaza. Lana. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you were doing that. Yeah. So uh, that started a whole line for us of taking people into our house and giving them a a roof over their head until they could make it on their own. Mm -hmm. Many stories along that line and many, many good and heartbreaking stories along that line. Sure. And of course, when when that was happening, that, that was coming out of a generation of people who were raising their children in the depression. And so obviously there was a lot of helping in those days. And that was a spirit that was upon the country, which we don't have quite so much anymore, I'm afraid. But I'm afraid too. Although I think it still goes on in the, in the dark corners, perhaps. Well, it still goes on certainly uh, within families, to a certain extent within churches. I mean, in Annapolis, we have a few homeless around and, and the churches take turns and, and the churches provide a meeting hall where they have cots. And so they, each church takes a month and they uh, take care of these guys. It's mostly men, of course, but. Um, yes. Well, we could go on to a slide or image nine. Okay. 
I was in church one morning when this was read. A fellow named Ellingwood, who was a legal advisor to then Governor Reagan, was speaking in our church. And he had been talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And uh, the night before I heard, that, I heard this read in church, I had gone forward to receive what they called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I had no idea what that was. But I knew that I loved Jesus, and I wanted all of it, all of Jesus I could get. So I went up, and he had us pray a, a prayer, you know, asking Jesus to forgive us and come into our heart. And then we asked Jesus to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, and he expected us all to speak in tongues, which two of us did and two of them did not. There were just four of us that went forward to that invitation, and my husband, who was a scientist is sitting behind me several rows shaking his head and going what is she up to now but this was what i heard the next day the spirit of our god is upon me because the most high has anointed me to bring good news to those who are poor god has sent me to proclaim liberty to those held captive recovery of sight to those who are blind and release to the uh, release of those in prison and as I heard those words, it was as if God was speaking to me. Now, in the Bible, Jesus is saying this before a congregation mm -hmm. and basically announcing his public ministry. But I heard it as a call from God specifically to me. It was as clear as if he was sitting in front of me speaking directly to me. And uh, so we continued you know, we, we expanded our uh, helping. I got into, I helped a nonprofit with their corporate papers to get those submitted to the IRS and so forth so they could have a nonprofit status. And the nonprofit was called Rebound, which picked up prisoners at the gate of the prison brought them in, found them housing, helped find them a job. In fact, they, we had found them a job before they were released so they could go right from prison to a job, but they had some kind of housing. Mm -hmm. And so one day there was a young fellow that was there who had no place to go, and we had an empty basement at that time, and so we took him home. I took him home, so I picked up people like them pick up kittens and dogs and, <laughs> and so uh, my husband had given up uh wondering at these strange behaviors he was starting to kind of enjoy all this adventure himself and uh so skip lived with us for a period of time and then his, got, his name was skip it was <laughs> oh my goodness okay his real name was frank but it was okay. skip uh, we call all called him Skip. He had been picked up in Winnemucca, which is about three hours north of Reno, which is a rural town, sleeping in his car with a brick of marijuana <laughs> and woke up to find the uh, police with a gun barrel <clears throat> right in his face. And he had been put, spent a year in maximum security before he came to us. So he was jumpy, let's say. <laughs> he was very jumpy. But he was a good kid, basically. He'd gotten on drugs in Vietnam and, and uh, was trying to do his best. But he, he was picked up by uh, an undercover narcotics policeman. I don't know what they're called specifically. Mm -hmm. And so that he broke his parole. But it, what I saw, you've seen the legal system. Uh, not living up to all of that we expect. Right. Well, in this situation, he had been entrapped, but he didn't have any big lawyers or anything to help him out of that situation. And so he was put back in prison. And one day we got a call that he had died. He hadn't been back in prison for long. And he and some of his buddies had been told that if they strained ditto fluid through bread they could drink that alcohol safely oh, well, he, he had just had several teeth pulled and so it went straight into his blood system 
and he died. And the others that did that did not die, but were awfully, awfully sick. Mm-hmm. So there, there's a side too of you give your love and help to another, but your heart is possibly going to be broken. Sure. You know? And so it took some time and counseling and so forth for me to uh, adjust and to realize. Pastor said to me after this, Moses said to the people, Today I set before you life and death, choose life. Each of us makes their choice. And I had to come to terms with that in this particular case. (laughs) Boy, that's a powerful story. It it was quite an adventure. I'm sure. But also just on the kind of funny side, while he was living with us, he was a good-looking young man. And I was in my late 20s. And if he and I were alone in the house and he was in the shower, I had to go outside because I would get very worked up over this idea of what could happen if I wanted something to happen. So you really get tested in all areas of your life when you start reaching out in love to help others. You get tested for your own values. Will you hold to your own values? Yeah, that's that's a good object lesson. <laughs> <laughs> Just we are human. We, you know, there is the psyche we talk a lot about uh, in our union group, but it is taking place in a body, with a heart, with emotions, with with uh, skeletons in our own closets. Right, and the, that's how we get psychic energy. But yeah, we have to choose the good. Sometimes what I say is that, you know, everything that you can see in this image and in your image is a place where the good was selected because we, we don't take things into our homes that we don't think are, are good. So the same applies to our relationships and so on. We, we have to select the good. That's right. So uh, let's take a look at image 10. Okay. So I read this in the Bible one day, John 14, 23. Jesus replied, they who love me will practice my teaching. My father will love them and we will come and make our home in them. And so by this time, I was developing a much more personal internal sense of God in me. And this became my great heart longing, that I would know this kind of union, this kind of intimacy with God who loved me. So this, this scripture just became like a, a heartbeat in the background of my life ever after. And, and now I'm knowing that, I'm experiencing that. But at the time, it, it was what most expressed what I longed for was that sense of union, that sense of free interaction between Jesus and myself in love. Oh, go ahead. Well, one thing that has come to my mind recently as I've looked at the struggles of some churches in bringing people in is I do agree that if you are contained in a church, gradually the the teachings of the scripture of that church, whatever they may be, and, and any religion would have, this would apply to, that they will gradually infuse themselves into you, which is basically what you're talking about here, I think. Mm-hmm, but, yes. but the question that I, has come to my mind is, how do you communicate to someone who isn't going to church, isn't in the church, maybe hasn't been raised in the church or in any religion? I I try to talk about religions in general. How do we explain to them why this is necessary for them? Well, I had a conversation with my 20-year-old grandson within the last couple of months and I was asking myself the same question. He, he had tried different jobs. He'd been in college for two or three years. He'd gone from one idea of a vocation to a different idea of a vocation. And 
when my grandson comes to visit, I say, Taylor, I've been around a long time. Do you have a question for me? So his question was, how did you know what you wanted to do? And so I basically said, well, I was inspired by a teacher and I wanted to do what she did and I did. And then I went on from there and I said, as I understand it, your heart is in uh, physical training. Is that right? And he said, yes. And I said, would you say that that is your uh, central heart's desire? And he said, yes, he, 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 it was. And I said, Taylor, there is, I don't know what word I used. I'm going to use the word force now. There is a force or an energy within you that knows you, that loves you, that has a, is wanting you to develop into the person you were born to be and make the contribution in the world that you're here to make. And would you like to say to that power, that entity, uh, let, you know, I want to know you. And then I, then because he had some church background, I mean, he's, he's leans a little more Buddhist, but um, so I said, you know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. Would you like to pray and ask, I, I think I said, God, to show you the way for your life, the truth for your life, and the way for you to live your life to become the person you were born to be. And he said, can I pray silently? <laughs> I said, <laughs> okay. So I don't know what he did, actually. Right. But, but he was silent for a portion of time while I was holding him in my heart in God. And within, I'm trying to think now, if it was two weeks, it was a very short period of time. He took his exam. He had taken one exam before to get his certificate and hadn't passed this time in t he took the, this test from a different a licensing agency passed it he just sent me a text last night showing me the certificate that he now was a personal trainer and he can send out his resumes and he he i feel that he's centered he's centered in his life for this moment now, sure. where he is in connection with the greater personality, I have no idea where that will go. But he, when he finished praying, he said, I feel really good. Mm -hmm. So something happened there. So I don't know what you can take of what I've said, but I think it can be said in a way that perhaps a religious background brings to it, but using very general terms, and especially as it relates to their life, their, what they're here to do, and for them to become the person they were born to be. I think those things are catch their interest. And then to say there is that within you, which will is, is helping you already, and would, can help you a whole lot more if you make contact. Yeah, I mean, I understand your approach to it, which is quite sensible based on your master's degree and your experience with churches. I think the way I would say it is that there is a spirit in you that keeps you going, and we don't know where that spirit is leading, but what you need to do is do what is presented to you at this time. And if you keep succeeding in it, keep doing it. But if you fail or you decide, well, maybe this isn't for me. I mean, suppose that he worked for six months as a personal trainer, and then he finds that that wasn't a very good approach for him for some reason, but maybe something else would, would strike his fancy instead. You don't have to stay personal trainer for the next 50 years Absolutely, <laughs> because right. you picked the wrong thing, even if it is the right thing in the sense that sometimes you do things and it 
brings you a result you don't expect. Like as a personal trainer, he might easily meet a girl, he might easily meet a number of girls. <laughs> uh, but what can happen in that situation is that uh, once you get serious about a girl, she's right away going to expect exclusivity uh, with you. And that means you can't be in the gym meeting other girls, uh, <laughs> which might interfere with your personal trainer job. <laughs> right? So there, right. There, there's I always... think I think in this case, what I was trying to get at with Taylor was, where, what is your heart speaking to you? Yeah. What's drawing you? Yeah, where, you know, where's the spirit going? Where is the spirit going? Where is right. the life? Where is the life in you wanting to go? Mm -hmm. And so then if personal training ends, where is the life wanting to go now? Sure. Because exactly. he's, he's hoping at some point to have his own business. So, you know, that would be a little different, you know, that would be a little different angle. Sure, it might yeah. be more motivational to return to college and get some help with that. So we'll Obviously, see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always like the old Cherokee legend of the grandfather who's out with his son. And he says, in your heart, you have two wolves. And one is love and all the good things in life. And one is greed and violating the rights of others and that sort of thing. And they're in a constant battle, these two wolves. And the grandson said, well, which wolf wins? And the grandfather's answer is the one you feed. That's so good. That's yeah. so good. I see quite a number of numinous slides coming up. Yes. So the question well, we're is... At, we're at a good point right now because the next section is midlife, part one. Okay, and so that begins with slide 11? Right. Why don't we s stop there and we can call this segment Young Life then, maybe. We're, we're up to about, I'm about 30 years old here when right. we start next time. All right, so let's call this Youthful Experiences as a part one. Mm -hmm.